Good afternoon, everyone. Calling to order a meeting of the Water Supply Planning Committee. It's September 4th, 2024. And we have present um, Mayor Oglesby, Amy Anderson as alternate, and uh, so we can we can proceed. Um, any changes to the agenda? Hello, Dave. Any changes? I, no, no changes. Okay. Um, we don't have to do a roll call, do we? It's on the agenda, so let's go ahead and do roll call. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. Let's do it. Okay. Director Oglesby. Here. Director Anderson? Here. Herr Paul? Here. We have okay. a tour. Thank you. And the first item is the um, uh, the mi minutes from July 1st. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Uh, Madam Chair, first item is a uh, public comment. You are correct. Thank you, Michael. Let's see if we have um, our... our District Council is correct. So if there are any members of the public um, online who would like to uh, address the committee at this point, please raise your hands. I am. Chair Paul, I see no raised hands. Okay, thank you. I see only one attendee. At the correct. Moment. Yeah. Okay. And we'll proceed to the uh, minutes from the last meeting. Any corrections? Additions. Okay, seeing none. Um, is there a motion to adopt these minutes? Uh, so moved. August B moves. Second. Thank. Thank you. Um, all in favor? Well, you can't do that. Okay, roll call vote. Yes. Director Anderson. Yes. Director Oglesby. Aye. Chair Paul. Yes. Okay. They're adopted unanimously. And now uh, we have three discussion items. First one, the Seaside Groundwater Basin. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll start this one off and then we'll have John kind of step in with the meat on the on the bones. Um, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt, just so in case there are any members of the public joining, we can, we can take a public comment um, after the presentation of each of these items, if there yeah, is any. Great. Yeah, so we all kind of know where we've where we've gotten, you know, with the adjudication in 2006 and the triennial step downs. Um, we're now basically at the point where all the step downs have occurred, and there's been a lot of discussion about where are we where are we going, you know, what path we're going to try to get on. Um, and as I keep listening in, I'm beginning to hear some consistent topics that come up, um, but different parties have different priorities and timelines in, in mind. And so I'm going to screen share very quickly here. Um, let's see. And so, you know, really there's kind of five current and future issues that are going to wait, uh, heavily on, on how we move forward with the Seaside Groundwater Basin. And because there's, you know, larger participation that's just simply Cal-Am, uh, you know, there's some discussion about how all of these uh, fit together. But taking, for example, I'm gonna use the pointer. So we've got, you know, the issue of leakage. This has come up recently, whether water that's injected into the basin stays in the basin and what that might mean. Um, and this is uh, something I'm, I'm going to ask John to touch on. Uh, there are replenishment uh, requirements for the standard producers who've created a deficit over time, uh, primarily Cal-Am, and they've voiced an interest in uh, doing an in-lieu recharge program whereby they would forego 700 acre feet of their pumping right per year for 25 years. And in various venues, they've stated that issue differently. 
Um, they have said that once the desal plant comes online, often with a, a, a nominal date of 2030, then they would begin that 25 year uh, in lieu recharge program. In other documents, they've said it needs to begin immediately uh, when Pure Water Monterey expansion comes online. We've shown scenarios where Pure Water Monterey expansion comes online, you wait five years and then you begin a replenishment program. But never, nevertheless, there is a requirement to replenishment to replenish the accumulated deficit uh, of CalAMs. And that's not the same as protective water levels, which is down here which is adding more water at a cost um, to provide even more water than the replenishment of the previous deficit. There's been a, you know, a couple of analyses that, uh, and John, you can maybe speak to this topic briefly, but um, looking at what level of protective water levels might be required, where you do it is, uh, has an effect. So if you did it at closer to the coastline, it would have greater impact and require less water. If you do it further inland, uh, it has slower impact and requires more water. And I don't think that there's a uh, affirmative conclusion on that yet. And then that takes us right to what infrastructure is required. Um, Bob Jakes, on behalf of the water master, has on occasion said all of the all of the infrastructure that would be needed to uh, both purchase replenishment water or purchase protective water for protective water levels exists, but not necessarily so if you were going to inject closer to the coastline, and then you would need injection sites and pipelines and so forth. And it may actually be uh, better to do that. So there's no real plan on the infrastructure required. And then in all cases, or, or at least in the, the last four or the last three, replenishment and protective water levels and infrastructure is how to pay for it. And there's been um, some recent work on this, how to pay for it, uh, including a presentation at the last Watermaster board meeting uh, presented by the attorney on options. And basically, uh, the plan is to go out and kind of hone those options, starting with um, funding mechanisms and uh, joint agreements among the parties first, and looking to the district as a funding source last. Um, and that may change over time. But these are the, the, the big issues. And I think what we're uh, what we're looking at is not all of these have really been answered. You know, have we defined our problem enough to pick a path? And I think the answer is currently no. We don't know if we're going to go left. We don't know if we're going to go right. Um, I think work should continue on figuring out how things can be financed when the need to finance them occurs. But I think on those previous issues. We don't have a good answer yet on really what is needed for protective water levels. When does deficit replenishment begin and in which form, wet water or in lieu water, and how much additional infrastructure is required. So continue to work on how to pay for it, but I think we're gonna need answers to these four outstanding questions. Um, if there is leakage, which I'm gonna to assert to you there's not, um, uh, we would then have to figure out how to kind of do makeup water um, just to uh, protect against leakage. But I think trying to pick off the first of these issues um, really then would focus us on the remaining three. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and give it to uh, John. Okay, thanks, Dave. I'm going to my screen. <clears throat> yeah. Let 
There, did it, that work? No, we're seeing blank. Okay. Well, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a spinning. There we go. I was seeing a spinning circle. There it is. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thanks, Dave. As Dave stated, um, there has been recent talk about uh, leakage uh, between aquifers, mm -hmm. this uh, between actual, not aquifers, I'm sorry, but between groundwater basins, especially with um, the formation of Sigma and the Monterey Bay um, groundwater area forming and becoming their own plan there's a there's a need to understand uh, what's happening between these two groundwater basins um i i know where the source of the of the the leakage um thoughts came from and um so what I did was I went back with our groundwater consultant, which is also the same groundwater consultant as the water master, and we did a literature review um, to, as a as a first step in trying to understand how how um, to best characterize how these two groundwater basins are interacting with each other. Um, but before we go into um, kind of the results of the literature review, which has spawned a, a couple next steps. I want to go back, step back to 1982, where the USGS first drew the boundary of the seaside groundwater basin. So this is a figure from uh, uh, what's the 1982 USGS mirror, and it was the first drawing, which is right here, of the seaside basin um, groundwater boundary. And it's based on what's called a flow divide where water on either side of this flow divide, water's flowing this direction on this, on one side of it, water's flowing this direction on the other side of it. Um, so what happened when the seaside basin was adjudicated, um, this figure was used in the legal document. So this this 1982 Muir figure became the adjudication or the regulatory boundary or the boundary to which the seaside water master has authority. Um, it's based on late 70s groundwater level data, but this was what it was and this was the figure that was taken. So when you say the adjudicated boundary of the seaside basin, this is its genesis from this 1982 report. Hmm. How does it fit? Now we, we take this. Th this is the D Department of um, Water Resources boundary, this uh, kind of hatched boundary or checkered boundary. It does not line up with this gray boundary. This is the adjudicated boundary of the Seaside Basin. So there's, there's a little bit of, of issues when we talk to Department of Water Resources um, about these different boundaries. Um, and this is taken from what's called the Bulletin 118, which is a Department of Water Resources adopted boundaries. So we can see we have the Seaside Subbasin, the Monterey Subbasin, and then the Salinas Basin. And so um, this Magenta is the outline of the groundwater model that we use to understand how we how we operate and how water flows around in the seaside basin. So to just briefly go through how oh and and what I want to point out here is at the northern boundary this is the Fort or, former Fort Ord and the Fort Ord National Monument. So there is no pumping beneath this exact boundary here there is pumping up in here and there's down in, in this area of the seaside groundwater basin but there's no pumping throughout this region so what that does with groundwater is you have a form of surface water divide where you have an outfall or a well or something that is pumping on either side and it is allowing a flow divide to form. So just, just much like a, a mountain ridge, if rain were to fall on one side, it would go one side. If rain were to fall on the other side, it would go on the other side. So um, you have a groundwater flow divide where you could think of Q1 as being Q in, sorry, Q in, uh, in groundwater speak is flow or, or pumping. So you have uh, pumping of, in the seaside basin and you have pumping in the Monterey area, and it forms this mapped ground divide. And, and we've, I went back through the literature and the literature review. And when he says Monterey area, it doesn't mean city of Monterey. It means that little um, sub basin north of the seaside. Yes, basin. sorry, sorry. Yes, Understood. Monterey, Monterey sub basin. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, 
<clears throat> and then what's happened throughout, and this has been mapped and it's been mapped and been published. Um, and I'll show you some of those figures later. Um, what's happened, as Dave mentioned, with the triennial um, reduction, it has the, the pumping in the seaside basin has relaxed compared to the pumping in the Monterey uh, sub area basin, and it's moved this ground divide, groundwater divide. So that's kind of the physics of how this groundwater divide works. So, so the takeaway message I'm trying to bring to you is the groundwater flow divide is moving around related to the stresses on either side of it. Hmm. Okay. Wait. So yeah, go ahead, Karen. Wait. Um... I'm, I'm trying, when you say the seaside basin groundwater pumping is more relaxed. Compared mean... to, compared to the historic levels when the uh, adjudication occurred, um, because one of the solutions, it w one of the things that the adjudication did was it quantified the amount of pumping that was happening at the time of the adjudication. And then it set forth a recipe or, and then it, um, it also quantified what the what the decision terms natural safe yield, which is the amount of water that can safely be pumped out of the seaside basin in a year without causing any more um, um, mining of groundwater or or um, de depressing of groundwater levels. So it is the natural safe yield of the basin, and it the the decision prescribed as Dave said triennial ramp downs of ten percent. So ten percent of pumping by the um uh by the standard pumpers each three years until we get into till it brings the the um overall pumping down to three thousand acre feet which is the natural safe field so when i say when i compare this slide you could think of it as this is the amount of pumping that was happening at the time of the adjudication and you could think of this slide as the amount of pumping that's happening today, which is less pumping. But I'm just trying to illustrate that it if if each pumping was the same, the groundwater divide exists directly in the middle. But okay. if the pumping goes down here, it moves the groundwater divide. So it's moving as as these stresses are moving, and the stresses are changing because because of the adjudication decision, and the stresses will change to the north because of the GSA to the north. I, I understand. And there are not comparable restrictions on the pumping on the from the other side. Not as of, of yet. They they are in they're in Sigma and they have to develop a groundwater sustainability plan to reach sustainability um, <laughs> levels uh, within 25 years. Um, and so they'll have to implement projects that will bring up to what Sigma make, makes makes so you pick um, kind of your aspirational groundwater levels, and then you have to develop a plan to get there, whether that's removing of pumping, whether that's injecting water. I don't know what they're, they, that's, they're, they're planning on their side of it on a different time scale than we are. Yeah. And it's not moving quickly from what I understand. No, it's definitely, I said yeah. it on those meetings and I would concur. Um. So this is a this is a figure that has i can sh point out what we've talked about before is here is the adjudicated boundary of the seaside basin um and then here is the model boundary that we use this heavy dashed line is where the groundwater flow divide for the santa margarita was mapped um in 2009 by hydrometrics, which now has become um, the Montgomery, uh, was purchased by Montgomery, which is the same consultant. So this is a, this was mapped by the same groundwater consultant showing where the groundwater divide exists in the Santa Margarita. So you can see it is not contiguous. It's at some points it's inside of the seaside basin and some points it's outside of the seaside of the adjudicated seaside basin boundary. So this is adjudicated and then this is the physical flow divide. So they're not they're non contiguous is the is the point of that. So when we did that, this is the results of our of our literature search. And so um, it was it was noted in the, one of the findings in this report was there's a flow divide that and the flow divide is not in the same place in the in the shallow aquifer as it is in the deep aquifer. They they move independently of each other and they're and they're in different spots on this map. Um, and so 
the work that we're doing right now with this consultant is to compare these two um, divides, go back through the groundwater model and map this divide moving around and see what it's doing. It moves um, according to different stresses on either side and it moves um, according to climate, of course, and any, any input is changing it. We wanna compare the water budget um, to the divide and the adjudication boundary. And I say that because this figure here is published each year in the seawater intrusion um, report. And this is something that's required by in, in the adjudication decision. It doesn't really say everything that needs to be included into it, but it's required. But what this report does is it uses this adju the adjudicated boundary and it reports flux across the boundary of the adjudicated line and same with this. So this is a Paso Robles and this is a Santa Margarita. And you'll notice the Santa Margarita flow divide that I showed you from the other figure right here is been, so I, what we did is we superimposed these two published figures on each other. And as, as you can see, this figure is reporting water in the Santa Margarita leaving the seaside basin. But in fact, it's just water flowing in response to the physical flow divide, where the actual physical flow divide is inside the adjudicated divide. But the adjudicated divide is where this report, and it's correctly reporting out the flow that's happening across the adjudicated boundary, but it's incorrectly reporting um, how the basins are interacting if you're trying to track what the physical interact interactions of the basin. So that's why if you were to say how much water is flowing across the adjudicated boundary in the Paso Robles aquifer, I could see how you could start saying, well, it's leaking out of the basin. But the truer statement is it's flowing across the adjudicated physical uh, legal boundary of the basin, not actually the physical boundary of the base. So we wanted to just point out that they're not the same thing. And, and um, it's even more pro problematic in the Santa Margarita. It looks as if water is leaving the Santa Margarita in this part of the, of the basin because the groundwater flow divide. When the groundwater flow divide is on the inside of the adjudicated boundary, it looks like water is leaving the basin. When the groundwater flow divide is on the outside, it looks like water is entering the basin. But in fact, it is not. But <laughs> but it is problematic because now the physical boundary of the seaside basin is actually outside of the authoritative boundary of the water master and so what to do about that i i don't have any of those answers but just to just as dave said we wanted to take a better better look at leakage and say that maybe using the flux across the adjudicated boundary uh, to drive um to drive a policy around leakage is not a good idea and that's and, pretty pretty and much what I have. Great, great, John. Thank you for oh. sharing that. And, and one of the reasons this is um, uh, kind of front of mind for us is there's been some casual suggestions such as, well, if you're using storage in the basin, which we are for both aquifer storage and recovery and for pure water Monterey, then maybe the storers should be leaving behind some percentage of their water to uh, offset this supposed leakage. And that is not the way our contracts are written. Um, so for Pure Water Monterey, you put 3,500 acre feet into the ground, you get gallon per gallon back out, 3,500 acre feet. Um, it would be both costly as well as um, uh, unknown who's going to pay for it to do that kind of leave behind, especially if the the combination of past history, so the accumulated deficit, um, you know, kind of resides with the prior age pumpers, um, which included, you know, a sand plant in Sand City that's no longer there. Um, it includes Cal Am and it includes others that are not storers. So to the, to the extent a, either a replenishment obligation or a leakage makeup obligation were to fall only to the people storing water, um, there's a, uh, an, an unequal burden being placed where the people who created much of the problem 
aren't going to be the ones uh, necessarily in that scenario providing replenishment. So we don't want to see um, a haircut taken on what is injected for either ASR or for pure water Monterey. Um, so anyway, it's um, I think you know that's one of the four issues, and I think we've solved it that we should be less concerned about leakage at this point in time, um, but we still need to start looking at protective water levels and uh, the other types of uh, things. But there's, in my opinion, there's no burning uh, problem that has to go out and be solved right away. I think, it, as I said earlier, I think it's important that we figure out how to finance and pay for water finance and pay for pipelines, finance and pay for injection. Um, it is not clear at this point in time that there's surplus injection capacity such that the water master, if, if the water master wanted to purchase replenishment water, that it can um, actually be injected at the time that it's available because it would be competing with existing uh, injection facilities for ASR and for pure water Monterey. So it's really, you know, it may be time to focus on those issues a little bit more than focusing on this leakage issue. Um, but there were, uh, and, and there still are several members of the water master who are very concerned about this purported, but now kind of proven to be non-existent leakage issue. Um, John, can you quit uh, sharing or did you want to show something else? Well, yeah, I was just going to say there is, there is on, so this was kind of the initial, um, literature uh literature search result but we're we're looking at these questions so we're we're, com we're completing new work so we're we're going to continue we're not just finding this and kind of stopping at it the district is still you know we're going to we want to compare the current the current and observed which is why i was showing you the other slide we want to talk about what the water budget really is and develop a tool in our modeling that follows this flow divide and does the and and does a more truer um groundwater um balance and we want to show this moving shift over time so we can we can just show people this is how it's behaving it's it's which is kind of you know we this yellow line here is from historically i could see it moving between this yellow line and this and this uh, black line here so i'm seeing it move around in, in those areas and then um and then we're going to take and model out um, pure water Monterey expansion and see what that does to water levels within the seaside basin and how it's moving around this this uh, um, flow divide as well. So we want to understand what has happened to it and what's going to happen to it um, using the modeling. So so that's all that the, the rest I had to say. John, a question. Um, what is the Salinas BC? What's BC? Uh, fourth fourth uh, dot fourth point. That's the fifth, up above. Yeah, oh, so, yeah. so this is, that's BC is boundary conditions. Okay. And so that is right here. You see these, these um, dot, dots and oh. cells right here. This yeah. is the boundary condition of the model with the Salinas Valley. And here are the water levels of the, of the Salinas Valley going up and down. And we, we're going to raise the, these water levels and lower them and see how that affects um, the, the flow divide. And the reason to do that is if and when the Monterey Subbasin um, achieves their plans in their GSA, they're going to be raising water levels. So we're effectively saying, we don't know how or when or why, we know why, but we don't know how or when this is going to happen. But it, but it, when it does, we would like to have some semblance of what we think is going to happen. I see. Prediction. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have uh, another question, Amy? No, I think, I mean, that's, that makes okay. sense to me. I didn't understand what yeah. this was. Well, okay. I uh, thank you. I want to thank you both for uh, John and, and Dave for, for this analysis, this research and analysis. It seems really important. And um, my only question at the moment, well, first of all, it'd be probably be good to share this with the, the entire board. We can talk about that later, but um, how, how aware are the other 
the participants in the Seaside Bay, the Watermaster um, group, this how aware are they yeah, of this? This presentation was given um, at the last um, technical advisory committee of, but I don't think the entire board has seen it. Um, so, and it was, it was, it was actually, it came up because the technical advisory committee is talking about um, updating the, this groundwater model we were just talking about. And I raised the point from the district's perspective on the TAC, we need to do, we need to develop a tool if we're, if we're spending money to change and develop new tools, we need to develop a tool that does the, the um, basin balance um, incorporating this moving boundary condition and so people didn't you know so people didn't totally know what i was saying so we we got these slides out and ran them through it saying as long as any tool we build needs to be able to accommodate what's happening here so we don't have it's like i was saying before major it's the fluxes at the adjudicated boundary are absolutely true and happening but they're not representative of what's happening at the so we need to build a tool that can do that Hmm. Well, that is great that you're educating us and and them, and probably the the Salinas uh, groundwater agency as well. Yeah, and finding yeah. out what's actually going on instead of basing a model on something that you don't know. Great. So it's it's very yeah. valuable because I I have been wondering for a long time what is this leakage problem that we hear about every so often and what is it really and what is it what are the implications so this this gives us a lot more understanding <laughs> um i know that you have a lot of questions you you know you want the you're going to continue to do research and develop better tools and uh but but what you've explained so far is really helpful very helpful thank you i would like to have a copy of those at least those three different we, models from the different times, just look at them and get what you're talking about in my head. Absolutely, I'll give them to Dave. Yeah, I'd like to see them too. So, um, Mayor Olgosby, did you want to say anything? Uh, no, I was just going back and forth, but I did. Uh, I shared a concern about, I would like to have that background information. And then my question would be, when would we share with the full board? But I think you guys, um, Approached that already, so that was just my two concerns. Yeah, and I, and I think we'll try to share it at the October board meeting because I'm going to have to miss the September board meeting. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Do you agree, the other members, committee members? Yeah. Do you agree, October yeah. board? Yeah, meeting? that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, if anything else from either of the directors, the committee members, um, then. Again, thank you. And uh, let's see if, uh, is, is there any member of the public that wants to speak to this report, this agenda item? Chair Paul, I see no raised hands. Okay, thank you. Again, okay. So let us move on now to the update on the supply and demand proceeding at the CPUC. Yeah. I'm guess And, and I, I will say there's nothing to update that wasn't mentioned, uh, Director Paul, when you uh, made some comments about the ex parte meetings at our full board meeting uh, in August, um, you mentioned that we have been meeting on an ex parte basis about uh, this proceeding, mostly in response to Cal M's ex parte meetings where they presented uh, excerpts from Chris Cook's uh, direct testimony regarding supply and demand. And I can tell you that uh, the city of Marina and Marina Coast Water District have now both begun uh, their ex parte meetings on the same topic. And I think we can probably uh, impute that they will be saying much of the same thing that we said, that um, there have been outside uh, experts, including uh, Peter Meyer, who's a nationally recognized expert, um, that all the interveners have a different view of supply and demand than does the applicant, Cal-Am. And um, we still don't have a good read on when we'll see a proposed decision. 
Uh, we've obviously withheld the right to have more ex parte meetings once a PD comes out. Um, but there's really nothing more to report other than there's two uh, things. Yeah, Fran may have something to report. I do. Um, for some reason, the ALJ put out um, another extension. Yeah. They had gone from September to December, and he just issued one. It hasn't been approved by the commissioners yet, but he wants to extend it to March of 2025. Um, so that is new and improved. And the other is our friends at the Farm Bureau wrote a multi-page letter directly to all uh, five commissioners, uh, continuing uh, their arguments about um, the validity of the source waters for both Pure Water Monterey and the expansion, and their plans, their very grand plans for um, continued expansion uh, in the valley and the need for some of the source waters that are also being used for pure water Monterey expansion. So I believe those would be two additions since we had our ex party meetings. Um, and the other is we will only have uh, four commissioners making a decision um, because the fifth commissioner used to head up um, the Cal Advocates Office. And because this was filed while he was in that position, he has recused himself. That's Commissioner Baker. So we have four um, commissioners who will be making the decision on this. So I didn't just want to add those. Thank you. Yeah. Any... yeah. And, and I guess I should add that although what led to it, I have a meeting with Ara uh, as Darian tomorrow, the GM of the County Water Resources Agency. And what triggered it was um, our stated progress in the allocation of the Pure Water Monterey expansion. But he really wants to talk about source waters for the Pure Water Monterey expansion, which then, of course, goes to some of the testimony behind how much is the, Monterey, is the Pure Water Monterey expansion really worth in a drought year versus a normal year and so forth. So there's you know that interlinkage of issues, but I will be meeting with him tomorrow afternoon and that source water issue is gonna come up as well as uh, how we allocate water. What organization is that, Dave? The Monterey County Water Resources Agency. So they're the, um, they're the current purchaser of the recycled water from the uh, Salinas Valley Reclamation Project for the Castroville seawater intrusion area. Okay. And then they deliver that water to the growers in the 12,000 acres near Castroville. Um, and so they, they kind of act as a conduit for the voice of the growers. And so a lot of these um, Farm Bureau letters, uh, Water Coalition letters, different letters that you've seen from the growers um, some of those same members are also directors on the County Water Resources Agency Board. So um, they're all interlinked. interlinked. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, I have, I have seen the letter. I've read the letter. Yeah. We, we've seen the argument before. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and you know, other? on the one hand, we've got folks like, um, well, folks out in the public who say, oh, you, you need to address this issue head on. Um, I met with Phil Wellman today about a number of issues, but on this issue in particular, I don't believe it's a public outreach issue um, because it's, it's not really a public issue for the average citizen on the street in the Monterey Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And any outreach that we were to try to do on the, you know, does all the source water exist? Do we have legal rights to it and so forth? It would pretty much be lost on the public and it's going to be um, fought, if there's any fight to be had at the Public Utilities Commission level and then ultimately the State Water Board level because it affects how, um, and, and for those of you who went to the, the forum that Senator, Senator Laird mediated, um, it goes to just that issue of who believes whom 
on how much water is coming out of the expansion and is it good enough? And that's really all they're trying to do are cast the seeds of doubt mm -hmm. so that if you believe that those waters are at risk or will be at risk in the future, then you have to conclude that a desal plan is needed and we must proceed with due haste. Um, so that's what's going on here. And, you know, it's, I, I think the supply and demand proceeding will help um, determine what the course will be with the state water board. So we'll just have to wait and see, but it's, uh, it's not helpful. Let's just put it that way. No. So in simple terms, it's Calam has one opinion and everybody else has a different one. So correct. Five why other would, <laughs> I'm just okay. Yeah. I don't know how many people it takes to count to ten, but apparently a very lot. lopsided record. Yeah. Yep. In this PUC case. Is there any do we have any information that the the growers are contemplating a um, a, re a re reclamation project of their own that would require the same source waters. No, I you know that they are looking at a version of aquifer storage and recovery. Um, the problem is as you get further north on the Salinas River, so up here where we are, the aquifers are constrained. And that's why they have names like the 180, it's 180 foot aquifer and the 400, which is 400 feet. And they're separated by clay layers or impermeable layers. And so if you were to just do percolation ponds, kind of up here at the mouth of the valley, that water is not really gonna find its way into the 180 aquifer, except through perforations in that uh, aquitard. Um, so, they're going to end up having to do injection well style uh, project. And I think when the, the estimate of how much that will cost comes in, they're going to say, oh, no, you know, what's, what's next on the list? Um, using some of these uh, waters, source waters on site is a possibility, and they raise that issue quite frequently. Mm -hmm. The, the regional board out of San Luis Obispo, which is a, you know, a subsidiary of the state board, uh, still holds on to the right to um, uh, force individual dischargers to capture and treat their discharge on their own properties. So imagine a, a grower who's got 700 acres, and right now uh, they irrigate, it goes through, through the plant root zone into the tile drains. The tile drains drain into either a, a ditch or a drain. And we capture that ditch or drain water and take it over to Pure Water Monterey. Well, if those growers were required to recycle that water on site for their own purposes as a little closed loop system, that would affect us. I mean, that, that is a source of water. And so they would be competing from that standpoint for the same water that we're using for not just the expansion, but really the base project. So there are some things that they might end up uh, looking at um, that would have an impact. But right now, all of the waters that we are using or will use are committed contractually. Um, Monterey One Water has what's called the Amended and Restated Water Recycling Agreement, which defines waters that existed at the time the original agreement was put into place, waters that occur due to new subdivisions. So like if Salinas grows, there's a, you know, after a certain date, the, the new waters coming into the plant are split 50-50 between what should go to the growers as recycled water and what is available to the peninsula for their purposes. Um, so if they were to walk away from that agreement, and it's been suggested, um, I've had a supervisor from the Valley say, well, maybe we'll just tear up that agreement. Well, then the six peninsula cities who currently have obligated their wastewater that goes into the plant to go to the growers would no, no longer have that obligation. So 
we could join together and we would have way more than enough uh, inflow to the plant to cover both the base Pure Water Monterey project and the expansion project. So anything that involves tearing up the old agreement and negotiating a new one is both an opening for them to deal with their Sigma issues, but it's also an opening for us to deal with our pure water Monterey source water issues. So it, you know, I, I would imagine it would be a standoff in that instance as well. So, mm -hmm. um, but that's the, the hidden threat in these letters, which is we may take our, our marbles and go home. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll just have to see how it plays out, but it, there's going to be a decision in this phase two supply and demand stuff with or without those letters. It does irk me personally that they're um, doing an end around formal process that involved testimony, supplemental testimony, opening briefs and reply briefs, and just saying, oh, here, here's new, new testimony for all of you to look at. Um, but it's too little too late to, I think, have an impact on the the judge's decision. So it's just basically trying to continue with keeping that confusion alive. Um, and, you know, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. It's it's not treated as part of the evidentiary record. Of course, still has a potential to influence decision makers, but yeah. yeah. Okay, anything further <clears throat> from committee members on, on this not item? Okay. No, no questions. Okay, thank you. Then let's see if the public has any comment on this item, on the supply and demand proceeding. If it's any Chair. member of the public wish to speak to this? Chair Paul, I see no raised hands. Okay, thank you. And then we'll move on to the last item, numbered yeah, item. And, and this one laundry. is, yeah, this one's even easier. There's nothing to report. Okay. Um, there are no delays. Um, and so that would be the first thing that I'd be reporting, you know, is, is the completion. That's newsworthy. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> but we're still, you know, over a year away from completion. So there's plenty of room for bad things to happen between now and then. Um, <laughs> but right now it's all been good. Okay. Well, very good news. Glad that. to hear it. I have one, okay. um, Dave, that uh, on, we, we just finished and pump tested the first of the two new wells. And it's actually the best well we've ever seen in the seaside basin. So, oh, good. Hey, the best you mean is just it's, working it, better. You, you the, the way that you measure um, how a well is is working is you measure the amount of flow that comes out of the well and the amount of drawdown that occurs um, when you're pumping a well. And this well has the uh, the most production with the least drawdown we've ever seen. Oh wow. Is which, it uh, which well, John? It's the the it's not the most northern well, but uh, of the two new ones, but the, the well one that they started on. Yeah. Wow. So that, that that just happened at the end of last week. So I just heard that information today. Is so it? Are, uh, are those? Are, go ahead, Fran. Are are those wells for for um, pure water Monterey expansion? Correct. Okay. Thanks, John. Yeah, you mean extraction well number one at the middle school, right? No, no, our injection well, the pure water. Oh, our, oh, our injection well, the new, okay. That's I why I was you. asking for a clarification. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Fran, and thank you, John. Um, right. Any suggested items for future agendas? We already discussed one, which we agreed to put on the October agenda earlier the seaside groundwater basin uh research. yeah i think i think by um uh, let's see our next water supply planning will be early november so i think by then i may have something to share with you on both uh doing something jointly with marina coast water district on injection as well as um, I may talk to John and Maureen to think a little harder about a fifth ASR injection well um, and what it would take to get started on that. Because I think, I think the time's right, the reasoning is right, 
Um, we obviously could do better while ASR well number three and four are out of service. Um, and, you know, time-wise, it'll take a while to get a new well developed, but I think it may be worth the investment. Um, and both of those topics are, are somewhat linked, but we'll, we'll be able to talk more about it. So, but it's two months away to the next committee meeting. So we'll just flesh out that agenda as, as things come up. Okay, I guess uh, people can send um, suggestions at any point, right? Yeah. On, okay. So thanks to all of you uh, at the meeting and uh, it's now adjourned. Yeah, and shout out to uh, City Manager of Pacific Grove for joining us. I hope we didn't bore you too much, Matt. And I see uh, Monica from uh, the Chamber just joined us and we'll see her at lunch on uh, oh, tomorrow. Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. yeah. Good, good. Thanks for attending. Okay. Thanks, Bye, all. All right. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.